It's entirely possible by listening to the voice to determine what is likely wrong with the voice. And most importantly, if you know what to listen for, you'll know what to look for, and you can correlate what you hear with what you see. Hello, I'm Dr. James Thomas. The phonogram is a tool, and it is to the laryngologist what an audiogram is to the otologist. It's a tool that helps you understand how the voice is not working and what part of it is not working. First, let's think about why voice is important to humans and why hoarseness is such a pain. Voice is sound that carries information over a distance, so our need for a good voice is so that others can hear us at some distance away. And the way we accomplish that is the voice is generally a pure tone. That pure tone competes very well with all the background noise in the world, and that way people can hear us and understand us. And when it's impaired, we say, I'm hoarse. But what do we mean when we're hoarse? Well, let's think of the opposite of a pure tone, that is a whisper, where, ah, how are you? Where the sound coming out has no tone to it all, or it has all the tones, and that is it's pure white noise. If we want to do it intentionally, the sound doesn't carry very far, so the whisper can be very useful. But if we want sound to go a distance and we can't, then we say that we're hoarse and it's impaired because noise has been introduced into the production of sound. Now the vocal cords have some special talents, we'll call them. They can adjust pitch and they can adjust volume. Pitch going from E occurs because the vocal cords can tighten. In volume, the vocal cords can maintain the same pitch at low volume, E, or high volume, E. They also have the ability to adjust clarity, which is to add white noise in intentionally. So you can go from E, have a tone plus intentional uh, softness. But let's start by thinking about pitch and volume. We're going to diagram the voice by placing a piano keyboard across the bottom or the X axis of the graph and placing volume on the Y axis. This will essentially look like a phonetogram, except we're going to go into more detail than a phonetogram does. So a normal phonogram will essentially have a range of pitch at low volume and a range of pitch at high volume that the person can produce with a clear tone. There are two main ways that the voice can fail in terms of quality. You can get a double pitch or roughness, or you can have air leak or white noise when you don't want it, a husky quality to the voice. We could think of this like engineers, and that is when we get roughness, we're diminishing the clarity of the signal. And when we get huskiness or, or air leak and white noise, we're increasing the noise. So either way, we're reducing the signal to noise ratio. So basically laryngologists are audio engineers who are listening to the voice and determining what the signal to noise ratio is doing. But the patient's coming to us saying, I'm hoarse, and it's your job to interpret hoarseness in terms of signal and noise. The laryngologist's tools then are the ability to elicit pitch change and elicit volume change, and then to be able to diagram where the voice is clear, and I've used green, where the voice is rough, and we'll use red, and where the voice is husky, and we'll use blue. I'll also let you in on a little secret, and that is that voice is only sound production at the vocal cords, so we don't need to confuse the issue with speech, and all you need is the vowel E to completely assess the voice. The vowel E works especially well because when you do put an endoscope inside and look at the vocal cords, E gives you the biggest space in the pharynx to see the vocal cords. Many of you might be familiar with the GRBAS scale. While this comes close to getting at what's essential in the voice, I think we can narrow it further. And the R and the B are the two essential items to predicting what's wrong with the voice. But what's necessary is that the R and the B be plotted against pitch and volume because it depends where in the vocal range these conditions are occurring. And if we can map out these conditions on a phonogram, we can figure out what's going on with the voice. Vocal impairment may be more than qualitative, and that is there can be an absolute loss of range and pitch or absolute loss of volume range. So I'll let you in on another secret, 
and that is your goal as a diagnostician is to alter the pitch and the volume. Make the patient sound bad. Go to where in their voice they have a problem. So you may have thought of your tools as being the endoscopes that you put inside to look at the vocal cords, and yet as the diagnostician, you have a couple of other essential tools. That is pitch and volume. Make the patient change their voice. While you're doing that, you are listening for noise, roughness or breathiness, and you're listening for any other changes in the signal, such as an onset delay where it doesn't come in soon enough, a sudden cutting out, a doubling of pitch or a pitch break or jump, or perhaps the maximum phonation time is shorter than you would expect. Since you've recorded this exam, you can go over it in detail and these findings direct your visual exam next. You know what to make the voice do while you're looking with the endoscope. It also provides documentation for going back in time and comparing changes in the voice. This is what I might call a typical exam for a general otolaryngologist. That is, it says normal, or perhaps it says no erythema, no edema for everything. I can't make out what's going on here. I have no idea what the voice sounds like based on this kind of documentation. And I will challenge you with the proposition that if you can hear it, you can absolutely see it on endoscopy. Let me take a moment to detail how I'm going to show the vocal cords here in this video. I put them horizontally because that's the way they fit best on a typical screen and we can get the closest resolution of the entire vibrating length of the vocal cord. So I've set the vibrating edge of the vocal cords to be horizontal with the anterior part on the left side of the screen. That means on the right side of the screen is the posterior of the voice box and that's the part of the vocal cords that open and close when you take a breath. Most of the pictures here, the vocal cords will be closed and will in general be parallel to each other or at least a completely normal set of vocal cords would be parallel to each other. The right vocal cord is on the top and the left vocal cord is on the bottom in these pictures. And we're gonna be watching stroboscopic movement that I've recorded and slowed way down so that you can appreciate some of the details. And a strobe light doesn't show true movement, it shows apparent movement because of how it's filmed with video only offering 30 frames per second and the vocal cords vibrating much faster. But it does allow us to get an accurate visual perception of how air is coming out of the vocal cords or between them and either generating pure tone or white noise. So let's go through a series of examples and tune our ears in to what we're hearing. I'll play a voice, you can listen to it and tell me what you think you're hearing. I'm hearing white noise. Now there's a tone underneath, but there's a lot of air leak and turbulent airflow. So I'll categorize this as blue on the diagram at the particular pitch that we're hearing underlying it, G3. Now let's look at endoscopy at the same pitch. The vocal cords oscillating on the strobe and they never close. In fact, there's this black space underneath the vocal cords. Think of that black space as a narrow venturi inlet where air is coming through and then rapidly spinning. And that's the air leak that is turning into white noise that we're hearing as huskiness. Let's listen to the same patient at a different pitch. What do you hear? I hear again an air leak, it's just at a higher pitch. So what should we see when we take a look? Well, in this case, the vocal cords are pulled longer, which is what generates the high pitch. And there are a pair of swellings in the middle of the vocal cords that touch, leaving an anterior and posterior gap. And again, we perceive these as blackness. The airway below doesn't have much light. So we see this black chink that never goes away. Through that chink is a continuous stream of air, which represents white noise. I think of it much like driving down the highway with your window cracked open and the air passing by or through that opening creates turbulent airflow, which you perceive as white noise.
We'll put a blue mark at C5 representing the air leak occurring at this pitch. Let's take a listen to another phonatory sound. What do you hear when you're listening to this? If we look at a spectrogram simultaneously, we can see that there are two pitches being produced, F5 and C6, and they aren't quite aligned on those pitches, and that's the scratchy quality. In this case, we can identify two different sound sources, anterior and posterior. Swungs are touching in the middle, and the vocal cord is broken up into two different vibratory segments, and they're of different lengths between the front and the back, so one vibrates at a slightly higher pitch than the other. Because our strobe light can only track one sound, it's picking one of those pitches and we see those moving smoothly and then the other one's flickering because it's not tracking that one. Let's listen to another example. Now in this case, I'm hearing a couple things. Overall, I'm hearing roughness. I also hear some air leaks. So I think we have a mixture of more than one sound source and leaking air. If we look at a spectrogram, we can see at least two tones showing up here on an app. And I'll plot this down low in his vocal range in terms of both pitch and volume that we're hearing roughness and air leak. When we correlate this with his stroboscopy, we can see why there's the air leak. That is, there's two dark areas anterior and posterior to the large hemorrhagic polyp. So that's the air leak or the softness in his voice. The double pitch or more than a double pitch has several possible sound sources. The right vocal cord weighs less than the left, which has the large hemorrhagic polyp hanging on it. And then that polyp divides the left vocal cord into two vibratory segments. And as it touches the opposite cord, it can split it into two different vibratory segments. So we actually have the potential for several sound sources. Listen to another sample. What can we get out of this? Well, we're getting a change over time. The voice is going from clear to breathy to rough to breathy to rough. We're also getting a change over pitch. As we go from high pitch, we go from clear, we go to a problem with the voice as we go lower in pitch. So we're getting air leak and then a double pitch, air leak and a double pitch. Let's take a look at the endoscopy and see what this correlates with. So let's start backwards with the pathology. The left vocal cord is weaker than the right. At high pitch, we also have the cricothyroid muscle activating because it's not weak. So the vocal cords are pulled relatively close together and we get a relatively clear sound. As we go down in pitch, the cricothyroid decreases its activation and the vocal cords become shorter. Since the left one has almost no internal tension on it, the thyroid muscle is weak, it gradually gets looser than the right. As it becomes looser, we get more air leaks, so we hear the white noise. And you could say, well, why aren't we getting a double pitch the whole way down since the left one is looser than the right? But what happens is the physics of airflow through, there's enough energy coming out of the vibration from the right cord to entrain the left at the same time. But then as we drop the pitch, there isn't enough energy and the left vibrates at a different pitch than the right. So we hear the diplophonia. So we hear gradually increasing air leak with a decrease in pitch, and we hear, we hear intermittent entrainment where both vocal cords are at the same pitch, but then there isn't enough energy to drive the weaker cord, and it vibrates at a lower pitch than the right. So let's take a listen to it again. So for everything we hear, there's a physics explanation for it, from the clarity at high pitch to 
the extreme air leak at the lowest pitch. Let's take a listen to another voice. What do we hear? Well, I'm hearing that an individual is attempting to sing a note and there's a delay, an onset delay. Every time she tries to sing this note, you hear air leak and then you hear the note. It was this type of finding that led Robert Bastian to develop the vocal swelling tests, which is to have your patient sing happy birthday to you and the jump up to two increases the pitch and you do that by lengthening the vocal cords. And as you pull them tighter to make the higher pitch, they come closer together. So if there's any swelling on the edge of the vocal cords, it touches the other side at some pitch. And on that pitch, as long as the volume is low, the air pressure is low, the vocal cords stop vibrating. So let's take a listen to this patient performing this task. Happy birthday to Happy birthday to So let's vary this test by singing the same notes, but singing them louder. What do we hear? Happy birthday to you. So she's singing the same notes, and this time they all come out. In fact, we can have her go back to the soft singing, and this is very repeatable. Happy birthday to... I can't get that bloody note uh, out. This vocal task of singing the same notes soft and loud and having a different effect, that is a phonatory stop at soft pitch on a given note, but clarity at a high volume on the same note, is the heart of the swelling test because the difference between the two tasks is more airflow blows the swellings apart and they no longer dampen the vocal cords during vibration. What should we see when we hear an onset delay? Let's take a look at this patient. At low volume, that is low subglottic pressure, the vocal cords here have been set to a high pitch, pulled tight, and the swellings are touching each other in the midline. So this low pressure leaks out through the holes, and then the individual doesn't like the sound of it, so they increase the pressure, and suddenly that jump starts the remaining segments of the vocal cord to vibrate. So that's how an onset delay is visible during stroboscopy. We can visualize the inverse pattern of an onset delay, that is a phonatory stop, by performing a stroboscopy as the individual glides up in pitch. And as they glide up in pitch, the vocal cords come closer and closer together because they're being tightened and lengthened. And when the swelling touches the other side on that particular note, suddenly the sound will end. Let's listen to a related vocal finding on the same task. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. On this vocal task, when she increased the pitch, suddenly the pitch jumped upward, a pitch break. Let's try a slightly different task, this time a glide upward in pitch. E And it's a similar finding. She's going up, we expect a pitch, and suddenly we get a pitch break and a much higher note comes out. Again, typically about an octave higher. Let's look at a stroboscopy to see what the visual correlate is for a pitch break. This individual is going up in pitch. So as she goes up in pitch, she's tightening the vocal cords, the swellings touch, and the vibrating segment is suddenly shortened. This suddenly increases the pitch, and if the length happens to be exactly half of the previous length, then the pitch would double or go up about an octave. Let's listen to the outcome of the same vocal tasks, but in the situation where the two segments are of dissimilar lengths. <laughs> We 
we can see from the spectrogram the two notes F5 and B5 are being produced. And when we look at the strobe, we can see one segment's longer than the other, but even if we couldn't, we can see that one segment is oscillating slowly in sync with the strobe light, and the strobe light can only match one of the two pitches. So the other segment just tends to flutter. And that's how we know that there are two different sound sources on the vocal cords. So far, we've been listening to single tasks so that we can train our ears to hear various problems with the voice. Now let's walk through a single patient, complete vocal set of tasks so that we can learn how this all comes together clinically in a patient. You can follow along on the voicedoctor.net website at voicedoctor.net slash vocal tasks and see them all listed. We'll start by having the patient speak in order to evaluate what their comfortable speaking pitch is. We have a 35 year old female whose pertinent history is that she's hoarse and that she loves to talk. Long ago, men found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. I listened to her read and determined what the approximate pitch is of her comfortable speaking pitch. It does vary a little bit on the words, but pick something in the center of what she's saying. I match the pitch on a piano. You can record the voice and match it to an app. Her pitch is approximately F3. The second task is to then have her make the sound on the same note and see how long she can do that on a single breath to obtain the maximum phonation time at the comfortable speaking pitch. He... This will give us a rough idea of whether or not she's closing the vocal cords completely. I would say a very rough rule is anything less than 10 seconds and the person's running out of air talking and they're pretty symptomatic and a young healthy person can often go more than 30 seconds on a breath at their comfortable speaking pitch. She comes up a bit short. The next task is to see how low she can go. E and at the very bottom of her vocal range, she has some roughness or flutter or vocal fry. And everyone has a bottom and a top to their vocal range. The second part of this is to find the top of the vocal range and have her work her way up and listen to her, what notes she can make. E As she worked her way up, I began to hear more air leak. This increased as she went up in pitch, and then suddenly she had an onset delay. I marked that on the note as a little blue upstroke. The next note up, she had a pitch break and her voice jumped upward. And as she got higher, she had another pitch break and had a very short segment of her vocal cord create a very high pitch. Next, a very rough estimate of what her loud voice sounds like. Hey! And she sounds quite clear when she does a... Hey! Next, let's perform swelling tests. We'll have her start somewhere in the middle of her range. We already know that we heard an onset delay, so we'll start below that and work our way up and see what happens with her voice. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. When I get a positive swelling test, that is, there's an onset delay at, on the 2U, I go and repeat that at a higher volume to see if the finding disappears. Happy birthday to you. Let's perform another low volume assessment at a higher pitch. Happy birthday to you. This time we hear a pitch break. Repeat at high volume. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. We haven't tried to evaluate every single note, but we're getting the idea that her pathology occurs at soft volumes and high pitch. And in general, low pitch and loud notes are her clearest. So let's look at her endoscopic evaluation now you could say, looking in here right away, everyone can see the lesion, there's a bump on the vocal cord. The value in performing these tests is several fold though. One, if you see the bump and it matches what you heard, then you know it's the cause of the pathology. And if you end up getting rid of the swelling on the edge of the vocal cord, you can also guarantee the patient 
that their hoarseness will go away. Additionally, I've picked a fairly large swelling here so that it's obvious for learning, but a small swelling will have same, the same findings only at slightly higher pitch, and you may not see a small swelling immediately with the equipment you have, but if you've heard it and it matches this exact same finding, then you know you have to keep looking to find the small swelling. So we're using this pretty good size swelling and we're gonna watch here and see how what we heard matches up with what we see. So we keep her volume down and now we can visualize the finding of a pitch break in her. We can see the swelling touches and splits the vocal cords into two segments and we can hear that sudden jump up in pitch. I offered her some intervention and cut the polyp off with surgery and now we're going to evaluate her about two months after that treatment. So let's walk through the same exam and see what her voice is doing. Long ago, men found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. Her comfortable speaking pitch is perhaps slightly higher, which we might expect since we've removed some weight from the vocal cord. E her maximum phonation time has increased from what it was before surgery. That means her vocal cords are likely coming closer together, and she can be more efficient about using the air for making sound. E Evaluating her lowest pitch, she can go a little lower than she did before surgery, and it seems to be clearer. Let's listen to her work her way up in pitch at soft volume. We ultimately do get an onset delay, although it's at a much higher pitch and there's much less audible white noise in her voice during soft phonation. Again, this means her vocal cords are coming closer together, and it's likely that something is not touching the other side. And if it is, it's occurring at a very high pitch, that suggests that if there is a swelling, it's rather tiny compared to what she had before surgery. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. We can still hear a little problem at her very highest note. So let's take a look at her endoscopic exam during stroboscopy and see how her vocal cords are vibrating. The stroboscopy shows two significant findings. One is that she has some very small swellings where she had the larger polyp from before surgery. And this is indicative of the vocal cords striking each other at that location and creating a little swelling. But we can hear it's not interfering with her voice very much when we listen to the audible phonogram testing. And secondly, when we watch her endoscopy, we can see that the swellings aren't touching even at high pitches. So they really are not the cause of her small, vocal impairment at high pitch, although they could be if the vocal cords were closer together. And that's the other impairment. Her vocal cords are still somewhat apart, and that likely comes from muscle memory. If she had the swelling for a long time before we did something about it, her brain keeps setting the vocal cords at the same distance apart, and that gap allows air to leak out. And it makes it difficult to make a soft sound clearly without an onset delay because of the gap. With the gap, the air will tend to leak through before it suddenly entrains the vocal cords. One of the most valuable aspects of a recording is that it allows you to effectively go back in time. Or in this case, if you've performed an intervention, you can compare the before and the after. Let's consider three possible outcomes from this surgery. Let's say we perform a phonogram and throughout her entire soft range and her entire loud range, we have essentially a pure tone no impairments. We could effectively say this represents a cure, 
and she's able now to bring the vocal cords nearly completely together. Now let's say we listen to her voice and we find again at soft volumes and the higher pitches we have onset delays or pitch breaks or air leak, then we can assume that there's likely some sort of recurrence, some sort of swelling that is back. And we can confirm this if we do an endoscopy. And there's a third possibility that we find something different. She's clear throughout much of her soft range, but as we get to the upper end, we start to hear air leak and onset delays, not as bad as before surgery. And this is a somewhat typical finding if an individual has had a swelling for a long period of time, their muscle memory is such that they remember to keep the vocal cords apart so that the swelling doesn't touch. And if they're holding them apart, that's enough of a gap that air can leak out and we get onset delays in the upper end of their soft range. When an individual comes to you for a hoarse voice, what they're really telling you is they no longer have a clear sound that will carry over distance or over background noise. As a vocal cord examiner, understanding that the two talents of the vocal cords to change pitch and volume can be assessed with the phonogram, that is listening to the voice over a range of pitch and volume and identifying where in that range impairments of roughness and breathiness occur. This will lead to an endoscopic exam at those pitches and volumes that are most impaired, helping you to identify the exact lesion causing the change in sound. The final secret that I'll share with you today is that the phonogram unlocks your endoscopic skills so that you can better define what is impairing the voice. And in future videos, I'm going to provide examples for all of these other various types of disorders that you can hear and see. Thanks for listening.